everyone. So we're starting the Civil War. We've just done the intro to it, and we've done the um, why the North and the South are coming into the head of this battle. So we've talked about Fort Sumter, and we've talked about the kickoff to this uh, conflict that the United States is going to have essentially with itself. So Fort Sumter happened in April. And now the North and the South need to come up with a battle plan. So today we're going to talk about mostly the Union battle plan and how that evolves. So here's what the expectations were. The Northern hopes were that this was going to be a brief war. It was going to be about 90 days, they hoped. In and out, really quick. Make it last, you know, so that we could blow the South out of the water, make them realize they needed to come back into the Union and make it a smooth transition limit the losses. We didn't want to have a huge loss of life. So the South's hopes were that we, they were going to have some early victories to show everyone that they were a force to be contended with, that there was, this was no laughing matter to them, that the North needed to take them seriously, and that they were serious about states' rights and maintaining their confederacy. They also wanted to bolster the confidence of their, le their leaders, the people in the South, and especially the volunteers who, who were willing to give their lives to fight for the Confederacy. And in that effort, they were hoping to gain more volunteers to bolster the numbers in their army. The realities of this whole thing, they quickly found out after a couple of battles, were that this was going to be a very hard-fought war, this was not going to be quick and easy, and it was going to be no easy victory for either side. Okay. So, we have the Anaconda Plan gets rolled out. Now, this is going to be also known as Scott's Great Snake because it's going to essentially act like an anaconda, a big boa-type snake, and it's going to envelop itself around the Confederacy and try to squeeze the Confederacy to, into submission. So, who's it developed by? Old Fuss and Feathers himself. Remember him from the uh, Mexican War? Winfield Scott. So it has two basic parts. One is we're going to blockade southern ports. The Atlantic, on the Atlantic side of the south and the Gulf of Mexico. We're going to set up a naval blockade. The second thing is here, we're going to seize the Mississippi River. And that's going to cut the south into two distinct pieces. Okay? Which will weaken them tremendously. So here's what it looks like. Now, this map, forgive my drawings, there will be no making fun of this, is a free-drawn map of the essentially the Confederacy. So the Union is up here, the Confederate states are down here. So the blockade is essentially going to work like this, where we're going to have the, Navy, the Northern Navy set up along the outer flanks here, where the Atlantic Ocean is and the Gulf of Mexico. That's part one. Part two is to take the Mississippi River. And in order to do that, you have to take northern troops and march them through the south and take the Mississippi from north to south and take, eventually, New Orleans. Because New Orleans was the key to controlling the Mississippi River. So that was going to be crucial in making this plan work. If we can get all that done, this snake is going to envelop the south and squeeze it into submission. That should all come together fairly well. So that's the visual on the Anaconda Plan. So the problems with the Anaconda Plan, the critics, this is what they had problems with. The blockade is passive. It just kind of sits out there in the ocean and in the Gulf, and it doesn't really do anything. The blockade doesn't really attack. So they didn't really like that. They wanted an aggressive plan. The Navy is also not suited for either or neither the blockade or to seize the Mississippi River. We didn't have the type of ships necessary to enforce either of these things. We didn't have the numbers of ships necessary to go with a blockade, and we didn't have the battlement ships necessary to take the forts on the Mississippi River. The other thing that they criticized was that there was no direct assault on Richmond. There was no overland assault. And the critics really didn't like that at all. They wanted a hardcore, aggressive plan of assault that was going to attack Richmond because we know that the object of a war is to capture the capital. So there was no plan for that, and the critics really, really didn't like that at all. 
Now, the reflections on the anaconda plan after it got into play, looking back, Scott's plan ultimately worked. Even though we sort of got away from it a little bit and we added to it, it ultimately worked. It did cripple the South. The blockade did work. Capturing the Mississippi River and New Orleans and cutting the South in two, that worked, okay? We're going to see Grant play a major part in that later on. However, it was not quick and decisive the way that Scott anticipated or predicted it would be. So that was a blow to, to Winfield Scott. The Civil War turned into a series of independently run campaigns. It was not one cohesive plan the way that Scott anticipated. It was a series of independently run things. So you had the blockade, which was one thing. You had the campaign on the Mississippi River, which was one thing. You had an overland assault where we're going to see that hokey pokey of generals that I talked about. You put this guy in and you take him out. And you put this guy in and you take him out. And you put this guy in. And Lincoln kept doing trial and error. We'll talk about that. Um, that is another whole mess of things that goes on. And then you had the March to the Sea under Sherman. And that's another independent campaign. It was not a cohesive plan for the Union to win this war. So that's the, those are the reflections. Now, up next, what are we going to talk about? Woo! We're going to talk about the battles. So that'll be the next time.